Hi, and welcome to Bottled Up. This week, uh, we have a very special guest. I've been thinking about the fact that we've done a lot of performers and directors, but we haven't really uh, honed in on any designers. And I think it's easy for us to sometimes assume that the designers in our industry don't have the same emotional connection with their work as performers do or directors do. And that's not true at all. And uh, the work of James Fouchard is evidence of that. Uh, Jim is a friend of mine. We've known each other for maybe uh, seven, eight years now. He is a designer I have looked up to for much longer than that. He has been a designer for over 45 years, done over 250 productions, national tours, regional tours, international tours, opera, regional theater, professional theater, you name it, Jim has been there and designed sets for it. In addition to that, he's a phenomenal scenic artist. Um, I am always blown away when I see Jim's work. Uh, Jim and I met working at Totem Pole Playhouse, and uh, he's been there for over 30 years. In fact, their new scene shop has been christened the James Fouchard Scene Shop. Jim, it is an honor to have you on Bottled Up. Welcome. Thanks, Tom. Happy to be here. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I followed you long before you even knew who I was, but uh, <laughs> I have been really not just impressed with your work. That would be doing you an injustice. Uh, connected emotionally, even from just photographs of productions that I've seen. And uh, I am really interested in talking a little bit about the fact that we sometimes assume that designers and technicians don't make the same emotional connections as, uh, as directors and performers. Uh, what say you to that? I don't think you could do your work, your art in this business if you weren't emo emotionally, deeply, deeply so yeah. uh, with that, because you have to have that sort of germ of an idea, an excitement, something that you're responding to in after you've read a script and had a, discussions with the director that, that touches you really strongly inside so that you can go then and translate that, transmit that to the audience in terms of what visual environment you're creating for the set to live in. I mean, for the, for the, for, for the show to live in at that time. That, that's what's always interested me about scenic design is the fact that you're really creating the world that the play will live in for that, for that couple of hours with that. And that you're drawing the audience in, helping to draw the audience into the experience. Yeah. I like the fact that you talked about the visual environment because when you think about the powerful emotional um, moments that we have, those little explosions of connection, they are often related to a singular image. And when, when we're creating sets, and I, I remember uh, one of my advisors used to call it an inside out sculpture, you know, uh, it's like working a sculpture from the inside rather than the outside. Mm -hmm. What we're doing is we're creating um, a series of images that evoke or sometimes provoke an emotional response. And so, yeah, when you step back and think about it, the designer, maybe as much as if not above all, really needs to have an emotional connection. I, I remember very distinctly as a young boy, my first connection uh, with theater. And it was a pageant. It was a, one of the pageant plays that went on at one of the local churches that my family took me to. And uh, it was of all things, a styrofoam rock, which to me at this point seems like it was this big, you know? Uh, I don't know, it was, a, I do remember it was like a woman at the well scene or something. And they were sitting on this rock and I was sort of, not really too into the whole thing. But when I, when I saw the lights come up on that rock, I was riveted and, and thereby followed the scene. Um, so there it is, the emotional response 
directly related to a visual image. Uh, do you have particular images that you have seen along the way that have had a similar result? Oh yeah, you know definitely. And 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 just carrying on from what, but before I lose it, is that um, in scenic design, um, the set is actually kind of like a series of guideposts for the audience, mm. and you can get say give a lot of information in those few seconds before the curtain rises, or in the few moments when an audience comes in and sits down, and there is no curtain, you're actually looking at the set, the environment you can say so much to the audience, give so many mm. triggers in their minds about what the evening is going to hold for them or make some, or questions also yeah. and getting them intrigued uh, with that. Um, and I'll say, uh, you know, and, and, and I mentioned to you when we were talking about, you know, earlier and stuff, um, I, I have a, an image on my uh, uh, beginning of my webpage, um, jamesbouchard.com. It's an image of the set that I designed for the turn of the screw that was for every man theater in Baltimore. And I remember sitting in one of my vivid memories in terms of later years, I'll get back to the early years, but in later years was sitting in the first preview, sitting in the back of the house uh, in, with the audience coming in and sitting down and that environment is there. And uh, the turn of the screw, you know, if, if, if uh, you know, it, it, is quite a very cerebral kind of kind of play in terms of uh, what's happening in in, in the uh, the governess's mind and everything. But anyway, I remember an audience member in front of me turning to her companion and saying, "It's like a nightmare." Mm. <laughs> and she That's said, so "They're job. getting it. They're getting it because <laughs> the set was a combination. To, in my mind's eye, was a combination of this." Gothic architecture, these these soaring, distorted columns, and what's going on in the governess's mind. So it was almost like a combination of old Gothic architecture and the brain set from Fantastic Voyage, the movie, <laughs> with that, with all those little cobwebs of neurons and things firing and stuff. So it almost looks like the cobwebs surrounding these columns and everything were also kind of perhaps this is inside somebody's brain so it was kind of nightmarish but uh, anyway to get back to some of my earlier experiences um i've always been drawing since i can remember i mean my earliest memories i've always been loving to create things to do things and you know you, you get to that age as you're developing, you know, in grade school in terms of like, you know, gee, what am I going to do for my life and everything? And I, I always thought somehow I was going to be in the arts. I was going to you know, be creating something, creating art. Um, and getting into like junior high school, late, you know, last year of junior high school, my friends were kind of like doing a, the variety show, you know, got involved in that. And I kind of got involved with it just because it was my friends. I want to join in with an activity. Yeah. So I wound up designing the set. So I kind of got the germ right there of, uh, gee, maybe this is kind of related to something I wanted to do. Got into high school and started to um, attend theater in the DC area. My, my mom and dad had been doing it and I got a chance to maybe to, to go along. So, um, and started to see a number of shows that were in the DC area, which is not like was it is nowadays where there's tons of, of different, you know, choices. I mean, it was either going to the National Theater to see national tours, the Washington Theater Club, which was a sort of a, uh, you know, row house kind of theater, you know, Davy Marlin Jones was, was doing it. So I, I went to my, traded off with my mom and dad going to some of those shows. But I went to see the national touring production of the Broadway show, Cabaret, Harold Prince directing, and Boris Aronson's uh, scenic design. And that show with a constantly moving scenic elements that Aronson designed in this, transitioning between the different locales in Berlin. And it, it was, it, like I said, it was very cinematic in terms of cast members and scenic pieces coming in from all directions and congealing into a, a, a locale. And it was just fascinating. It was fascinating to see, all, see how 
choreographed the whole experience was and and that it was a combination of visual elements and live actors and performance and it was just it was electrifying and it kind of started touching off something in my mind in terms of gee i could do that you know it, it's just I, I i like i like designing i like building models i like i like doing research i like history and it was all of these things that my interests sort of congealed and it was sort of like it was great to be able to do something that you can create and then share with an audience you know and then they can experience that live it isn't just looking out at something on a wall it isn't just a static image uh oftentimes in theater again for particularly for multi-scene productions things have to move from one locale to the other and how you do that and and how you can in the way something moves and in the way something transitions you can really pull the audience into to the experience even more um and then also at the same time as i got interested in finding out more about um scenic design and how i could use my talents and my 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 crafts to work in that that uh, that profession uh, i started to grab you know books at the live school library and look at set designs and things and as i happened to be at walden books at the mall one of the first malls that we had around here montgomery mall and they had the, you know those tables out in the thing you know for sale books they called them the remainders and they happened to have a copy of uh, Joe Mielziner's book, uh, Designing for the Theater. Joe Mielziner is, is one of the, the deans of American scenic design. Um, his career started in the early 1920s and went on until the 1970s. And he had a tremendous influence on, uh, on theater and, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and other designers. He had a number of assistants who went on to be great designers in their own. And it's been quite an inspiration. He started out as a uh, fine arts painter and wound up getting into theater. So he had, he had that, those talents as a, as a wonderful painter. Uh, but at the same time, he learned the craft, the practical craft of how do you create a three-dimensional environment as an art piece that people have to live in and work in and has to be practical i mean so there's there's that part of the equation you're that's kind of like being the architect and engineer uh as opposed to just a painter or a sculptor and i enjoyed that too i, I enjoyed that challenge yeah when i when i look through mel Ziner's paintings um I, they are some of the most moving uh oh yeah renderings that i have ever seen but um I, I often look at some of those and think, I would like a shot at just trying to create that set to see if it could hold up to the light and the texture and the depth and the atmosphere that he creates. It's really quite amazing. Yeah, and, and, and he became a lighting designer too. I mean, from very early on in his career, yeah. uh, he, um, and, and again, his career was 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 growing and taking place at the very beginning of like modern stage lighting yeah. and the creation of you know not just some footlights and some you know strip lights on top but actually spotlights and and, and ways to sculpt light and yeah. he learned from you know eddie cook who was you know century lighting and everything who were who were creating these instruments and everything the the craft of how how to what happens to a set, what happens to a costume, what happens to an actor's face under different qualities and different colors of light. He even had his own like little dark room in his studio where he had wow. little miniature lights and gels and he would test out how they responded to an actor's face, to a costume, to the way the set was painted. So his being able to develop those skill sets advanced the quality of, of, of the entire uh, design of, of the productions that he worked on and everything. And uh, uh, this is funny because he, um, of, of the Tony Awards he won, um, he won both best scenic design and best lighting design for 1776 on Broadway. 
Wow. And he, um, he accepted the first one in scenic design. And of course he did the obligatory kind of this, thanks the producer, thanks nobody, whatever. And then um, he won in the sledding design category, he was called up and awarded the Tony for uh, best lighting design for 1776. And he came up and said, I'd like to thank the scenic designer of this show. <laughs> because half of the scenery that's up there was there to mask my lights. <laughs> yes, the nuts and bolts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I see, um, I certainly see the influence of Mel Ziner and Aronson in your work. Um, I don't know which one you connect with more. I see more Aronson in there. I, I think uh, of Aronson, and I believe this is very true of of your work that I've witnessed is that it's always full, but it's never busy. And I think that is a very hard line to walk. Could you talk yeah. to us a little about yeah. It's interesting because yeah, you can say that for, for Aronson. You can also say that for, for Milziner because in his book, he, uh, the, uh, the first one he wrote in the sixties designing for the theater, the one that I referenced, he, he likens the, 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 the creation process of a set is like designing with an eraser. Huh. Yeah, Getting yeah, yeah. Rid of all of the extraneous detail and elements other than the ones that really, you know, progress or, and lead, lead, you know, help you lead the audience to the right sort of mindset in terms of, of the set. So it's, it, it's taking away all of the extraneous details other than the ones that just sort of further your concept with yeah. that. And what I loved about Aronson, and I kind of agree with you because the thing I love about Aronson the most is that if you go and look at his, there's big books on Aronson and everything too. Yeah. The, you, you don't see a hard set style you know, that, that comes through on everything. Oh, that's, you know, Aronson or something like that. It's almost like he is reinventing himself each time with every concept for every production, every, every show. Yeah. And I, I, I think that's great. And that, that's, what's, that's what I enjoy the most is the discoveries that I can make approaching each show that, um, so I'm designing specifically for that and not necessarily putting myself you know, my signatures so far <laughs> ahead of create, trying to create the best environment for that production. Well, and I know that, uh, at least based on my reading, um, that Aronson, unlike a lot of fellow designers at the time, would only take one job at a time. Mm -hmm. He wanted to get fully uh, immersed in discovering that concept and then playing it out, of course, in his pieces. Oh yeah, yeah, and he he would uh, it, sometimes. I mean, I was reading Harold Prince's like little uh, book biography about about his experience in the theater, and it would sometimes say, you know, he loved Boris, but he said it would drive him crazy because he would want to keep talking and talking and talking and talking about this concept and you know showing photographs of like streets and things and you know look uh, at the look at the quality of light on this person's face or looking at that signpost and and, and and Harold Prince was saying you know when is he going to give me a sketch or something you know and then all of a sudden he would just sort of present this after talking and, and it was just it was perfect it was just you know well that, was, uh, that's a great place you just triggered something that I would like to jump off on um, you talked about looking through uh, set design books as a, as a kid picking up the Mel Ziner book at the library and I, I do remember um, someone gifted me uh, in, in high school when I started to get interested in this, uh, some set design books. And I remember just, I could endlessly flip, I didn't read any of the text. <laughs> I should have, I've gone back and read a lot of the text since then. But just flipping through those pictures was so emotional for me. And I think it drew out of me, you know, that I, I wanted to do this, but when you're in that moment and you're conceiving of an idea or you're catching an image with the light a certain way or your concepts coming to you and you're just filled with the joy of the experience a couple things i'd like you to talk about number one how do you convey that in appropriate manner to the production team without just sort of gushing endlessly number two 
how do you sustain that energy when it's just drawing to the eighth of an inch? Well, I think the, and, and, and this is an important thing that, that, that you know, touched on is, it isn't just us, uh, uh, you know, working on our little easel or our little drawing board and, and, and creating that, and, and, and there it is. Theater is a collaborative art. Mm -hmm. So at the beginning, you're working with the director and then the other designers, and you're just one part of the whole experience. And if, if anything, you want it hopefully to be homogenous. I mean, that, that it all seems to be coming out of the same image, maybe, you know, even the same hand, you know. Um, that's the exciting part. It's also the challenge um, because, you know, you want to respond. You want the other artists, the director and the designers to respond to your work. But at the same time, you want to suck their energy in, their ideas in, and maybe combine and come up with something that is even more appropriate and even more spot on for, you know, the direction that, that we want the production to take. Uh, and nowadays it's not just, you know, the costume designer, lighting designer, it's like, you know, you know the properties, artisans, the sound designer, um, <laughs> all of that becomes yeah. really, really, you know, they're, they're crucial to be part of the experience and they, they, they should all meld together as a whole. So I kind of feed off of that energy, but I'm, I'm always kind of, excited because I, I don't, even in the summer theater kind of, you know, two shows every, I mean, one show every two weeks, you know, that it used to be a totem pole or whatever. I never felt, I, each show was important to me. And I really came with the thing of like, I'm not just going to do this and get by because it's only going to be for two weeks, you know, or, and it's just a summer theater. It's important for me to fit every production look uh, and, and, and feel like I put everything into it uh, yeah. with it. Uh, so I, I've got that drive to begin with. And sometimes that drives people crazy. You know, I mean, the, you know, I mean, in, in being in the shop, you know, and being, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, working with everybody, I just, you know, you've got to be the cheerleader, you know, your own cheerleader. Um, but when it comes down to the, the, you know, the, the actual, what some people would be the drudgery maybe of drafting out every piece of scenery in its correct dimensions and, and specifying what materials there have to be and what color and stuff. I really enjoy drafting. I mean, it's, it's, it's really rewarding for me. I, I, I love the process of what I have to do here at the studio. Yeah. Um, and then being able to, to present that and everything. Every paint elevation I've ever done, every model I've ever, ever built, um, I, I really enjoy the work. So that gets me through, at least, you know? <laughs> well, that doesn't help me much, Jim, because I stall out about three quarters of the way through and I was waiting for the golden nugget. Yeah. Uh, how to keep the emotional connection when yeah. I don't want to do one more plate. <laughs> the hardest part the hardest part is sitting in those budget meetings <laughs> oh yeah well yeah that's true <laughs> you know because no matter where you are what i mean i've worked on productions that have been the sets but budgets are you know hundreds of thousands of dollars i mean some of them went pretty high and then you know every summer you know where we've got you know <laughs> A, 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 a tiny, tiny little, little sliver of that to yeah. get through a season and, and to do a show. But having to get down and first of all, be in the ballpark with a design yeah. because, you know, it, that's, that's the important, you know, thing. Um, so that you're, you're at least in the right, you're, go, you're at least on the right track, even if you have to sort of make some concessions or some alternatives in terms of things to be in the money. But that's the business side of our of our art, of our craft. Um, and there's no getting around it. You know, there, it's not a blank check. And, and you've got to learn to be able to design, you know, for the realities of, of the, the, 
the uh, the production aspect at yeah. the same time you know be able to maintain your vision yeah well and i and i do want to say for most of you watching this will be in the local area total pool playhouse does some amazing work for a small uh theater um it's beautiful it's in the middle of the state forest down in fayetteville uh it's a great place to see they they always stage at least one or two of jim's designs um and it's amazing what they do on a small budget i strongly encourage you to get out and see the work that they do uh that rowan joseph does at totem pole playhouse i make a shameless plug it is a fantastic place so uh, and they, they need your support too especially and, now <laughs> yeah and it, it uh, they provided me with my first opportunity to not just look at jim's work through the lens of a computer, but actually to paint some of his work and work alongside of him, which has been. Uh, and great. thanks for that. You were fantastic. You know, I was, I love that you hand, you know, you hand somebody that model piece or a paint elevation and to know that, they're, that you know, they're going to treat it well. They're going to be able to follow it and, 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 have that piece of scenery look spot on so oh, you still had to redirect me a few times one thing i learned from you jim is uh to paint with more water uh you know some you know how it is that some painters like to paint dry some like to paint with more water some like to do neither and just keep it in the flow of you know their their pigments and their vehicles but i really learned how much water i can play with well you know and and, and i got that from from one of my first big mentors uh, getting out of college, uh, I worked with a local designer here in DC uh, at a, a scenic studio that was run by the D DC government. And uh, his name was Bob Troll, Robert Troll. And uh, he was probably the most gifted natural painter and natural set painter as, as well as, that I've ever met. Uh, and had a chance to work with for two summers and uh, and uh, five years full time at, at the uh, shop down in, in Washington. And we did the Shakespeare at the Sylvan Theater. They did uh, the uh, ballets, uh, Washington Civic Opera. But I would watch him. First of all, when he would do these gorgeous renderings that kind of reminded me of Milziner's work, you know, I mean, it's just wow. effortless capturing light in, you know, and, and the quality of light and things on a set in watercolor. Um, and he, so when I'd seen his, cause I, they would be in the Washington, they would be on the, his set designs, his renderings would be on the front page of the style section of the Washington Post when I was in high school. And I thought, oh my God, this is great. So I'm getting to work with this guy. And I'm just, I really have to see how he's created these. Because, you know, he would be sitting there in the studio there, his studio there in the scene shop, his drawing board says, God, I got a chance to see how he, what, what kind of, you know, brushes is he using? What kind of watercolors? So he's just sketching out and in pencil and doing, getting the perspective just all right without any drafting or stuff like that. And um, he takes out a, a little tin rectangular box of, of tablet watercolors. And I remember they said Donald Duck watercolors. It was just like out of a kid's section, he bought them at the drugstore. Yeah. So, you know, you only have about eight little tablets, you know, yeah. and created these beautiful renderings with just that <laughs> and wow. and of course you know and then it kind of transferred to a scenic painting where you know he would paint these gorgeous you know backdrops yeah so i got to watch him and it was again he he would use the water the thinnest paints possible and still get that vibrancy and everything of that. And then it allowed him to do a number of different effects and things. So that's kind of where I, <laughs> I learned, you know, to, you know, to, uh, you know that, 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 that economy, you know, of pigment. <laughs> yeah, well, that's good. Um, I want to go all the way back to the beginning on something uh, before we close out here. Um, you mentioned and by the way, please visit uh, Jim's website. It's jamesbouchard.com. Uh, and you'll see the great variety of his work. And I'm sure what's on the website uh, doesn't probably represent 10% of all that he's done in his career.
But I'm really interested in, you talked about the Everyman Theater production of Turn of the Screw and having the curtain open at the beginning. So this choice of curtain closed, curtain open is really the director's choice, but that's often in conversation with the designer. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about the performing arts, allowing emotion to come out of us, drawing it out of us. How do you make that choice of whether it's best to leave that reveal as a moment of impact or whether it's best to begin to massage and prepare the audience with an open curtain? Uh, sometimes it's actually the physical uh, requirements of the performance space. Um, yes. And actually every man at, at that time, you know, the turn of the screw was, there was no curtain. You walked in and that you, you were seeing the environment. So they got a chance to absorb that and let, let their emotions and their thoughts sort of cook for a while, which I, I thought was great uh, with it. Um, yeah. Other times, though, you do have a choice. You either have a curtain reveal or, or whatever. But most theaters nowadays, it seems like the choice is to have to sort of come in and there's, you know, uh, the set's there. I mean, if there's a preset of lighting and it sort of helps to, to, to create a mood. Um, but, you know, there are other times where, you know, you have, I, I think some shows work better with a curtain and then, you know, a reveal coming up. The set can still, in those few seconds before a single word is spoken, you can communicate a lot of information to the audience. You can really just sort of lead them into the environment and, and a, a clue about what the, you know, what the evening is going to be like. Um, but, um, you know, sometimes it's nice to have that. Musicals are really good to, to, to do that with, you know, where you just, you, you, you know, it's like opening up the book, opening up the cover of the book to the first page and things with that. And I, I think those are nowadays, you know, some of the most appropriate, you know, for, for, a, uh, for a curtain and sometimes the most necessary because, you know, musicals, you've got so many things that are moving around and stuff and doing that. But um, it, um, it, it, it's become more of a, a, a given though, that a lot of directors just, you know, don't want a curtain, you know, and, and doing that. And unless there's a, a real need. Used to be it was something that, that was a given. There was always, you know, a curtain there. But now well, I think there's more of a choice. Yeah, well, the curtain going up is replaced with the light shift now. Yeah, yeah. So in silhouette or we're in some warmer, delicate light. Um, yeah, and you can have that even sometimes, even the presets, trend, you know, kind of move and, you know, change, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. through, and, and now you also have, you know, the whole uh, sound design that can help contribute to a sort of a pre-show kind of um, uh, thing, you know, and, and, and that's often done that way, you know, even with, with, with straight shows, with book shows, you might have some sort of, you know, peri music playing, or sometimes it's just sounds and things, or something, something orally that you're, that help trigger some thoughts and feelings, emotions in the audience. And that's what's great about live theater. I mean, it's a lot more immersive to a, to an audience than just you know sitting there it, it, and watching something on a flat screen, either in a movie theater or you know as nowadays where we're all sort of confined at home, you know, scare, staring at a screen, you know, in our family room or you know on a laptop or whatever. Um, the fact that you're you, you're part of the environment in theater as an audience member, and that there's an immediacy to it is, I, I think, stirs a lot more emotions and a lot deeper emotions than you can get by by looking at you know an, an image you know on a screen. Yeah, that's something that this time is certainly teaching us. Um, I mean, sports is a good example. Uh, many of the sports are making a comeback without audiences and the, the TV worship, <laughs> which should be ballooning up because people can't go to the sports are, are not doing well. You know, it yeah. is a live event there, no matter how good our cameras get, our, our virtual technology gets there, there is something about the immediacy of a live and in-person event um, 
that gets that gets inside of us. You know, and, and the fact that you're 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 with an audience, you know, all together, and they're responding individually and 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 communally, yeah. uh, so that that affects you too. You know, hearing yeah. other people laugh or clap or you know, yeah. whatever. You yeah. know, their responses, you know, uh, trigger something in, in the individual also. Yeah. Well, Jim, hopefully we will be experiencing that again at Totem Pole next summer. <laughs> yeah. Some live uh, theater, but uh, I, I do want to thank you so much for taking the time to do this interview with me, and uh, I appreciate your work so much. Oh well, thanks a lot. Well, it was really great. I mean, I've always enjoyed talking with you, but it's you know it's you know great. We you know, wish we could do it you know sitting you know right across from each other in the same room, but this is fine. <laughs> yeah, it's do for now. Yep. Well, uh, a special thanks to Jim. Please check out his website at jamesfouchard.com. Uh, check out the Total Ball website where you can uh, see Jim's work um, on a regular basis in a regular summer. And uh, thank you so much for tuning in. And remember to support the arts even during this time. And we look forward to seeing all your faces as we get back to the performing arts, hopefully in the next year. Bye.